Chapter 5, Advanced Theories of Bonding. We'll begin with Section 5.1, Valence Bond Theory. Here, we are getting into the details of how bonding actually works. So there are two major theories we're going to look at in this chapter. First is valence bond theory. Now valence bond theory says that bonds form from the overlap of two half-filled orbitals. So each atom has a half-filled atomic orbital and these atomic orbitals overlap with one another to form a bond. Now the more overlap there is, the stronger the bond is. And as we talked about in chapter 4, the electrons in the pair are attracted to both nuclei. So for example here, this right here represents the nucleus and then this right here represents the orbital. So there's a positive and negative end to the orbital. Again here we've got another nucleus and an orbital and this black dot represents an electron. So let's say these two atoms come together and these two half-filled orbitals overlap with one another to form a bond with which both nuclei are attracted to the electrons in this bond which is what holds the bond together. Now bonds, they form to achieve a lower potential energy. So here the elements, the atoms, they are always trying to get to the most stable or the lowest energy state. So for example, here with hydrogen gas, H2, hydrogen gas's bond length is around 74 picometers. The reason for this is because this bond distance minimizes or achieves the lowest overall energy of the system. Now if we elongate the bond. So as we elongate the bond, you'll notice here that the energy begins to slowly increase and then eventually it gets to zero because at this point the atoms are sufficiently far, far apart and they don't have any interaction with one another. Now if we start to push the bonds closer and closer together, you notice the potential or the energy spikes and it almost goes infinite it's because if we push the nuclei too close to one another, well eventually the positive forces from both these nuclei is going to cause the nuclei to fly off into space. They're going to bounce off one, with one another. They'll get too close to interact. So there, there is this nice happy middle ground here where they're not too close, where the nuclei repel each other, but they aren't so far that they have no interaction. They're kind of right in between here, the optimum distance that achieves, achieves the lowest overall energy of the system. Now let's take a look at orbital diagrams. So we learned about these back in chapter 4. So let's look at the orbital diagram for each element, and we should see that the orbital diagram should show at least one unpaired electron. So for example, if we look at the orbital diagram for fluorine, you notice that fluorine has that one half-filled 2p orbital there. So fluorine can make a bond to another element because it's got that one half-filled orbital. Neon, however, cannot. Neon is a noble gas. Its orbital diagram is completely filled up. This is generally why noble gases are so unreactive is because their orbital diagrams are filled and so they don't really have any way to make a bond with another element. Okay, so there are two types of bonds we are going to discuss here in valence bond theory. First, there are sigma bonds. Now, sigma bonds, they form by end-to-end, -end, or sometimes I call it head-to-head -head overlap, along the internuclear axis. So if you draw a line between the nuclei or along that internuclear axis, along the internuclear axis, the overlap will be along that line. Now possible sigma bonds can include S to S orbitals overlapping, S and P orbitals overlapping, or even two P orbitals overlapping. So here we've got two S orbitals, they are overlapping to form this bond, and the overlap is along the internuclear axis. Same thing here with this S and this P. Again, the uh, interaction is along the internuclear axis, and with these two p orbitals here, again, the overlap is right along that internuclear axis. So these are all visual representations of sigma bonds. The other type of bonds are pi bonds, and pi bonds form by side-to-side -side overlap on opposite sides of the internuclear axis. So again, if we drew that line right along the internuclear axis here with pi bonds, it's side-to-side -side overlap. That's kind of above and below that internuclear axis. So both p orbitals here must be parallel for a pi bond to form. So they are they run parallel to that internuclear axis instead of being perpendicular to it like we saw with sigma bonds. So there are a few different combinations here. p orbitals, they can make pi bonds or they can also make a sigma bond. So let's imagine here we've got px orbitals. Now really the 
spatial designation here could change. I could call this PY. I could call this PZ. I could call this PX. It's a little arbitrary, but here for the sake of argument, let's say we've got these PX orbitals. So if we take two of these PX orbitals and we push these uh, nuclei closer together, you'll notice that these orbitals, they will overlap side to side above and below that atom-atom axis or the internuclear axis. So these two two px orbitals interacting would form a pi bond. Same thing here with these py orbitals. If we pushed two of these nuclei together with py orbitals, those would interact from our vantage point in front and behind of that internuclear axis. It's a parallel or side to side overlap. So this would also form a pi bond. Here, if we took two of these pz orbitals and we pushed them together, they are coming together along that internuclear axis. That's end-to-end -end or head-to-head -head overlap. This would form a sigma bond. All right, now we talked about the, in the previous chapter, single bonds, double bonds, and triple bonds. So you need to remember this. What are those bonds composed of? So the easiest one to remember are single bonds. Single are sigma. So single bonds are one sigma bond. Double bonds are one of each, one sigma and one pi. And then triple bonds are one sigma and two pi. So here with this single um, this single bond here, we've got one sigma bond. Here with oxygen gas, we've got a double bond. So this is one sigma, one pi. Here with nitrogen gas, we've got a triple bond, which is one sigma and two pi bonds. Okay. So that is the conclusion of this section. I've got five practice problems here for you to try. So pause the video, take a few minutes, give these a try. And once you've given them all an attempt, here are the answers for those practice problems. So that concludes section 5.1. I'll see you in the next one for section 5.2, hybrid atomic orbitals.